You've heard me say this, and I, I, I think it's true that in the very first chapter of Mark, we have the, I believe, the theme and the context of the book in the first words that Jesus speaks. And it says, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God has arrived. The kingdom of God is here. And Jesus begins from the very first chapter to reveal who he is. Through his miracles, through his teachings, through his healings. We, we see in a powerful way and, and, and over and over again, Je Jesus demonstrated that the kingdom of God has come. It's arrived. And it's done in, in so many different ways. And, and now as we step into the last part of the Gospel of Mark, it's not so much about who he is, although that's still significant, but it's about how he is going to bring about salvation, how he is going to set us free. The, the disciples and those who were following him, I think, believed he was going to be a political messiah, that he was truly going to set them free from Roman oppression, but, but Jesus came for a different reason at this time. And now in chapter 11, he's, he's headed into Jerusalem for the Passover. The Passover, as you know, is a celebration and great time of commemoration for the Jews. It's a time when they look back and remember how they were delivered from slavery from the Egyptians, how God caused the, the angel of death to come, and anyone who had the, the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, the, the angel would pass over. And so they were set free from, from slavery, and there was that great exodus with Moses out of Egypt. And so they, they believe that, that, uh, you know, that God is going to set them free again. And it's a, it's a great time for the Jews, but a great hassle and a great interruption for the Romans. See, here's the thing. Thousands and thousands of devoted Jews from all over the world would come and arrive there in the holy city of Jerusalem, hearts full of excitement and hope for the nation of Israel. The population of Jerusalem would triple during the feast. So, so Roman military security would be radically increased. It would, it would be a time when the city, if you will, by the, the Romans would be on high alert, high safety. It's the time Israel celebrates its deliverance, its freedom, and, and Rome always feared some radical Jewish zealot would start a riot, would kill a Roman official or take down a Roman soldier. And you had all these different kind of groups and sects of, of Jewish religious people coming into the city, and many times they would clash with one another. And so we, we look at this passage of Scripture. We, we normally call it the triumphal entry. It, it's a central story of the Bible, and if you didn't know, it's, it's recorded in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Mark now, as we move into the final third of his gospel, it, it, this, this last part of the gospel from here on is, is all about that last week of Jesus' ministry. It, it, one third of the writing of, John, of Mark is, 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 is focused on just one week in Jesus' life. When we have this amazing passage of Scripture. It, it's, it's interesting to me that, it's, that it's, it's in all four of the Gospels. And when God wants to, I think, highlight something, when He wants to uh, place great value or importance, he, he repeats it. It's kind of like when you hear Jesus say, verily, verily. That means truly, truly, or certainly, certainly, and then you say, oh, well, this is something I need to listen to. Or like in Isaiah, when the angels would say, holy, 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 they say it three times, and you think, well, 
This is a strong declaration that, that God is holy. And now four times in the scripture, we have this entry into Jerusalem. It describes or implies the importance of the event. This is a major climatic point in the Gospel of Mark. Listen to the story here in Mark 11. When they drew near Jerusalem to Bethpage, verse 1, and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you've entered it, you'll find a colt tied. No one has ever sat upon it. Loose it. Bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street. They loosed it. But some of those who stood there said, what, what are you doing loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches, or as we know in other gospels, palm fronds and trees spread them on the road. And then those who went before and those who followed cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked around at all things, as his hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Lord, we just ask that you would help us to hear your voice, to receive your word, to have a heart that's, well, that's good soil, where a seed can fall and be planted and bear much fruit. Lord, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive all that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you're a Roman and part of that city there that day, and you hear that this is a triumphal entry, or you see Jesus coming into the city with a donkey and 12 disciples and some people waving palm branches and throwing their coats on the ground, you would not call it a triumphal entry. You go, this is a guy on a donkey with 12 disciples, and there's really some, some peasant people who are crying out. And in your mind, in your eyes as a Roman, it wouldn't look too impressive to you. They, they had a triumphal entry. They had such a thing they called a triumphal entry, and it was when a Caesar or a king had conquered a people, and he would come in either on a prancing horse or a gold chariot, and behind him would be his warriors, his men, and behind them would be a group of the people they defeated, shackled and in chains, and behind them would be the, the, the spoils, the, the gold, the silver, the riches taken from the enemy by force. And, and to earn a triumphal entry in the Roman world, in their mindset, you had to have at least killed 5,000 of the enemy. So, so they see Jesus coming in, not, not in a gold chariot, not on a prancing horse, but on a donkey with 12 fishermen, and common men of no real distinction, peasants, throwing garments on the ground. And I'm sure the Romans are going, oh, this is pretty impressive. <laughs> but Jesus would triumph in a way that no one else ever has. He would triumph over the grave. He would triumph over sin, over death. In Acts chapter 3 and 4, when after the Holy Spirit had come and 3,000 were saved, that first message by Peter, well, at the gate beautiful, there was a lame man that got healed. And on that moment in Acts chapter 4, 5,000 people were brought in to the kingdom. It's an amazing, listen, it's a powerful, miraculous triumph that's happening here in 11 chapter of Mark in Jerusalem because of the death 
the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here's the amazing thing. That triumph is still happening today. People are still coming to the Lord and still being delivered and still being saved. It says, when they drew near to Jerusalem to Bethpitch and Bethany, on the Mount of Olives, he sent his two disciples. Bethany and the Mount of Olives. This was the home, Bethany, of, of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And Jesus will spend his final days of his life in their home coming back and forth to Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives is, if you ever get to go there and you get to stand on the Mount of Olives and, and you look across at the um, Temple Mount, you're, you're about 200 feet above the Temple Mount looking down and there's that Palm Sunday trail to your right or left depending on where you're standing. And it's an amazing, wonderful view. It's called Mount of Olives because all along the hillside there, there's ancient olive trees today still growing. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful sight. It's, it's where David would, would make his way up that mount when he fled from his son Absalom. It's the place Solomon, there on the Mount of Olives, erected uh, statues and idols for all his foreign wives so they could go and worship. It's where Ezekiel witnessed the glory of God on the, on the Mount of Olives in, in his book. It's Jesus makes his triumphal entry from the Mount of Olives. It's where Jesus, if you remember in Luke chapter 19, he stood on the Mount of Olives and he looked at Jerusalem and he began to weep over Jerusalem. Jesus ascends to heaven on the Mount of Olives in Zechariah chapter 14 verses 4 through 5, we also have his, his second coming. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, the other half toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal, Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come, and all the saints with you. There's a lot that happens on the Mount of Olives. It's amazing. In Mark chapter 11, it says, after Jesus comes, comes into the city, after he makes his way there, it says, so they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street. They loosed it, but some of those who stood there said to them, why are you doing this? And you, you know the story. Jesus comes riding in on a donkey. And, and this is interesting because Jesus, for the most part, as I read through the Gospels and the life of Jesus, everywhere he went, he walked, except a couple of times he was in a boat, Right? And even then, one time, he walked on the water. He chose not to take the boat out with him. <laughs> he, he, he was always walking. But this is a very special time. This is the only time we see him ride an animal, a small donkey, a colt. It's an open proclamation of his ro royalty. He declares at this time that he is a king. And sometimes kings would come in on a donkey as a symbol of peace. He comes in humility, he comes in simplicity, and the Jews, they're expecting once again this deliverance, this liberation from Rome. I mean, Solomon, when he was made king, rode in on a donkey. And the people now see Jesus coming and they're crying, Hosanna, Hosanna to, to the king in highest. It means save us now, save us now. Their heart's cry is to, to, to see their, their, their nation restored, to, to bring it back, if you will, to the glory of, the, of King David. Here is their king. And yet he's not come to purge the nation from a foreign power, but to purge anyone who would believe from their sins. 
to save them from the power of Satan himself. They're looking for a savior for their people, their, their land, and their heritage, but he's the savior for the whole world, not just Jerusalem, not just Israel. Jesus came, as you know, for all mankind, for you, for me. In, in, in John chapter 1, verse 12, we have a verse that says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. That's why he came. They cried out for salvation. They needed, they wanted a savior. They wanted a deliverer. We, we all do. In John 14, verse 6, we, we have uh, uh, this verse. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Amen? So there he comes. He's coming as a savior. Jesus came into the city on a donkey, a symbol of peace, not war, humility, not pride, not in pomp and ceremony like a Roman king. The crowd is his disciples and people he has healed. He's probably got Lazarus with him. Don't, don't you think that, that Lazarus and Jesus were good friends? I mean, if he had raised you from the dead, wouldn't he be one of your, your buddies? I think he would. Hey, Jesus. Uh, He's probably walking in with Lazarus. He's probably got blind Bartimaeus that you saw last week. He's, he's probably with him and, and Mary and Martha and, and probably all kinds of people that he had healed and cleansed and cast demons out of. The list could go on and on. And, and he comes in peace. He comes in the power of the Spirit. And that's how he comes to you and me. He comes with love, demonstrated on a cross. Doesn't force his way into your life. He doesn't overpower you. He allows you and I to choose. He's given us this amazing free will. Jesus, the one whom all things hold together by him, who created all things, doesn't force you to do anything. Doesn't force you to serve. Doesn't force you to follow him. He conquers your heart with grace, with love, with mercy. And this is amazing to me. It's, it's the same way he comes in, into Jerusalem. It's the same way he comes into your heart and into your life. He comes very humbly. He comes very recognizable, though, of, of a Savior. And he doesn't push his way into your life. In fact, Scripture says this, that he stands at the door and he knocks till you say, I'm going to open the door. You know, we, we, we had all those kids over yesterday. None of them knocked on the door. <laughs> they just came bursting in. So unlike Jesus, all, all of them. <laughs> but so, so welcomed. But there they came. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. I, I who could rush in, I could force my way in. I have all power and authority over all things. But he humbly very lovingly and mercifully knocks on the door and says, if you'll open, I'll, I'll come in. He died on the cross for your sins and mine, and he's done everything that he could possibly do, fulfilling all prophecies about his coming, becoming a sacrifice on the cross. He becomes the ultimate Passover lamb, if you will, and he proves his love, his heart for you and I. And he comes as a crucified Savior. In verse 11, and Jesus went into Jerusalem after he makes his way into the city. Makes his way down that, that hillside of the Mount of Olives. Past the Garden of Gethsemane, which would be right down the end of that trail. Across the Kidron Valley. Through, through the gate and into the area where the temple would be. And it says that he went into Jerusalem, into the temple. And when he had looked around at all things, as his hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve, back probably to Mary and Martha's. doesn't sound real significant, real important. 
that a crowd followed him to the temple or anything like that. But, but it has a message, a purpose of why Jesus came and, and what he was getting ready to do. See, let me have your attention. This was an official visit of the true king of Israel, an inspection tour, so to speak, to check out the very heart of the nation. This is the, the heart of Israel. This is, this is the, the place where the, the Spirit of the Lord resides, where the priests make their sacrifices, where the Holy of Holies is. And, and Jesus, being the Savior, being the King of Israel, goes into the temple. And listen to what it says. So when he had looked around at all things, he just looked at everything that was going on, everything. He probably saw the money changers out front, which were complete ripoffs and exploitation. He saw the corruption and the hypocrisy and the pride of, of those religious leaders. He saw the religious ceremonies being carried out for the most part with no meaning, with no heart, going through the motions, so to speak. And Jesus stands there and he watches the whole thing. He's looking around and he doesn't say a word. And I would submit to you that in some ways, he comes and he looks and he sees you and me. Everything we say and everything we do and everything we think. You know, the scripture says we're, we're two or three gathered together. There he is right in the midst. Isn't that interesting? I, I, I believe what, what, that Jesus is here. And he's looking around at everything. He's looking around at you and me and how we worship and what we think and the motive of our heart and why we're here and what this is all about. And what happens next is pretty interesting. It says, now the next day when he had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig having leaves... He went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. He came to it and he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. And in response, Jesus said to it, the tree, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. So the next morning he leaves the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus and on his way to Jerusalem, he's hungry. It's morning. And he sees this fig tree whose, whose leaves, it mentions the leaves, would, would, would be mature leaves at this time. And you would expect to see the pre-fruit on it. The, the, a, a fig tree would have a, a small fig at the beginning. And those would drop off. And then the mature figs would come after that. Fig tree has a special meaning in the Old Testament. Many scholars believe is a symbol of the nation of Israel. And like a fig tree... Israel had been chosen. It had been blessed beyond measure as God's people, and they were to, to bear much fruit. They were to be a light to the nations. Mark mentions Jesus seeing the leaves, the maturity of the leaves on the fig tree. And these leaves imply, in fact, that, that, that some fruit would be on the tree. But instead, it's barren. Leaves are a sad substitute for fruit if you're looking for fruit. Israel, blessed by God, has great appearance of spiritual life. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the high priest, all its feasts, all its festivals, all its entrapments, and all its glory, if you will. Very impressive. Lots of pomp, lots of ceremony. All style, but no substance. I've told this story before. When I was a student at Southeastern Bible College, I was still pretty engaged in surfing at that time. And I had a van, and I would drive it to the coast and uh, surf certain areas in Cocoa Beach and up, up around that area. And I had some guys who, who were, were attending Southeastern that told me, yeah, we're surfers. They had some nice boards. They had all the you know, trunks and... and the, the, Looked to me like, yeah, these guys probably know how to surf. But when we got there and we paddled out, 
There was this one pro surfer I knew in the water named Claudie Coggins, and a couple of my buddies, you know, wax her board, they paddle out, and it was very obvious to me from the very beginning they had no idea what they were doing. They're hanging off the back of the board. If you know anything about surfing, they, they were total kooks, total grims. And I paddled as fast as I way, could away from them because <laughs> I didn't want anybody in the water to know I brought those guys out in the water with me. O on the beach, they looked great. But here's what they were. They were posers, <laughs> total posers. And, and, and this is what's happening with Israel. They're posers. They, they got all the robes and the ceremonies and the incense and the prayers and, and, and all that would look like it was holy and righteous from the outside. But they're like this fig tree, all leaves and no fruit. All the appearance of something that, that would be bearing fruit, but none was there. And 70 years later after this, the judgment of Jerusalem will be so complete, so, so horrific, that Josephus, a historian who lived during that time, will note that the Romans, when they destroyed the city of Jerusalem, they ran out of space to erect even one more cross that they put so many to death. And, and, and Jesus he came into the city, he, he looked around, he, he curses this fig tree. It's kind of like the tree says, come here, I can meet your hunger, come here. But when you arrive, you, you've been completely deceived. And this is the heart of Jesus, this is the mindset. All show no substance. The temple and the religious leaders had great show of, a, of, of appearance, great demonstration of devotion, if you will. But to God, they were hypocrites. To God, they were empty. The Gentiles were even denied opportunity to come close to God. They were restricted from the, from the inner courts of the temple. They had to go to the outer courts they, where they would be exploited by the money changers. Once Israel and its love of God, a, a great light, a, a great thing that God had, had raised up, now, if you will, just a smoldering wick, barely burning, and Jesus sees it. Hypocrisy, and, and please hear this, hypocrisy, hypocrisy, someone said, keeps close company with self-deception. Hypocrisy keeps close company with self-deception. And this is what happened in, in the time of Jesus when he walked into the city of Jerusalem. He went into the temple and saw everything. He saw fruitlessness, empty religion. See, it's not him. It's not Jesus who needs us. <laughs> we need him to, to, to save us, to make us useful, to make us fruitful. To never be a believer who just goes through the motions or a church with just events and services that fill dates on a calendar. It's empty. It's, it's fruitless. But to love God together, to be a part of the, the temple, if you will, the body of Christ, connected, growing together, on mission together, on, in our city and in our world. Here's what's, here's what's happening. The kingdom of God has shown up in Jerusalem the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And, and here's, the, here's the interesting thing about Jesus. He sees, as it said here, when he stepped into the temple, he sees everything. He sees it all. And the next day when he gets up and he approaches this leafy fig tree, he curses it, I think, as an example of, of, of the, the nation of Israel and the religious hypocrisy of Israel. And he says to this no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. And it's not long after that that Jesus will be tried. And it, it begins with the religious rulers of Israel. And if you know the scripture, it says, 
they, they, they wanted to crucify him out of envy, out of jealousy. This one that had come to save them, this one that had come to redeem them, this one that came to reveal the, the, the God of Israel to them, they turned their backs on him. It's a sad declaration for, for Israel at this time. This triumphal entry of this king is not recognized by the religious leaders. In fact, it's despised by them. Jesus comes and he, he knocks, so to speak, on the door. He steps into the temple and he looks around and he sees everything. Isn't it amazing that the kingdom of God came? And I think it's, it's, a, it's a quite an illustration sometimes of you and I that he comes and and he knocks and he calls, and, and, and we're so caught up sometimes in either religious things or other things in life that we don't even recognize who showed up. They certainly did not. Even though the common people did, and they cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, save us now, save us now. But they misunderstood how he was to save we need him to save us, to make us useful, to make us fruitful, not barren. It's an interesting passage of scripture that draws us, I think, to a, to a place to ask ourselves those questions in our life. Am I bearing fruit? When the Lord steps into my world, what, what does he truly see? When he, when he, when he comes and examines everything in my life. It's kind of a scary thing to think about, but he comes in love. He comes in grace. He comes in mercy, and he comes to redeem. So, so part of the question today would be, do you know him? Ha has, he, has he knocked on the door of your heart, and have you been willing to open it up and allow him to come in? He's, he's coming back again one day, Scripture tells us, and he'll place his feet on the Mount of Olives. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ? Uh, have you seen what's going on in our world lately? Do you know what's happening? Or are you like this? It's a crazy world we're living in. I mean, I don't even want to talk about it. Every time I, I do watch the news, which, which I, I don't like watching it anymore, you've got all the political rhetoric that's driving everybody crazy, especially as we approach this crazy election. Not only that, but you've got everything that's going on across the world with China and Russia. You've got earthquakes and fires and and you've got floods, and it seems like every time you look around, there's this major catastrophic event happening in the world. Is, is, that, is that true, or is, am I watching the wrong news? You guys see something else? <laughs> and then you mix together the confusion of that which people once called evil, now they call good. And if, if, you're, if you try to do... To, have a standard or share with someone, well, I think that's, that's wrong for that to happen in, in lifestyle or in culture. I don't know if you've experienced this. I certainly have. Now you're the bad guy because you've said something was wrong or something wasn't right. And the scripture declared that one day that which, you know, is is seen as evil will be seen as good, and that was seen as good will be seen as evil. And I would say we're way down that road right now. We're way down that road. So one day again, he'll come, and his foot will rest again upon the Mount of Olives. But this time he won't come as a suffering servant. He won't come as one to die on a cross. He'll come on a white horse, ready to wage war, ready to, to, to proclaim and, and declare that he is the great King of kings and the Lord of lords. He came this first time humble and meek and goes to a cross. But one day he's coming back in great power and great glory with all his saints that will be with him. And, you know, this is my hope. 
that I'll be somewhere among that crowd. I'm sure I'll be way, way in the back, but I just want to be there. I just want to be there. You know, I, I can think of people who, who I, I knew this Haitian pastor I used to do uh, ministry with, and very humble man, very, very loving individual, had a church, he had a, he had a medical clinic, he had a school, and I'll never forget, he said to me one time, I spent the night in his home, his very humble home there in Cape Hatia, and he said, Pastor John, you, you sleep in the bed. No, no, I'm not sleeping in your bed. He goes, no, no, I'll sleep on the floor. And I go, no, no, I'm not sleeping in your so, so I did, I slept in his bed. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, Americans are soft. He said, Haitians are like rocks. He, he was right. And then he asked me, he said, so, so you pastor a church there in Florida? I go, yeah. He goes, they pay you a salary, right? I go, yeah. He goes, Haitians don't pay. I said, so you don't get anything? Oh, sometimes they bring some fruit or they'll, they'll bring some vegetables. But, but he says, I take care of them. I have a school. I have a clinic. I have a church. And I just trust the Lord. And I went, and I thought, wow. So, so I say, that he'll be way up front on a horse. I'll be way in the back because I'm soft. I'm an American. But I say all that to say this. Jesus sees everything. And the thing he sees the most is your heart and mine. And my prayer would be when he steps into this place, that he doesn't see a group of people, myself included, just going through the motions. Just, hey, I came to church, I checked that box. Doesn't see me going through my week, just, you know, oh, well, Sunday's the time I get holy and religious. But that when Jesus steps into this place, he, he examines it, it sees everything the scripture says, that he would see something in my life, in your life, in the life of what's known as Coastline Calvary Chapel, a place that is and desires and wants to bear much fruit for the kingdom. And I hope you're a part of that. Amen.